on my, my 19th birthday. I was a college student um, and I got arrested uh, for throwing a party um, at my university. And I remember, you know, I was in the back of the cop car um, on my way to the jail. And it was a, a black woman that was um, taking me to jail. And she apologized to me. She said, I'm sorry, you just happened to be the wrong color on the wrong night, right? And just hearing her say that, a police officer, right? And I'm like, wow, is there anything I can do about this? And it's like, no, you know, that's just kind of the system that we're in. But what you can do is, you know, kind of take a stand and um, make sure that you're being intentional with your, with your life and your actions, right? Because during that time, I was just doing what I thought was cool. You know, I grew up in the hip hop culture and that culture really um, influences negative, you know, negative things, right? Um, and so I think that's just another thing that comes with being African American. It's like seeing people that look like you influencing you to do the negative things. Mm. And it's up to you to kind of decide, do I want to continue down this path and just do what I'm being told? Or do I want to take a different route and, you know, be a, a positive influence in humanity? Mm. And so I took that latter route. <laughs> that's why we're here. That's why we're here, right? That's why we're here in Paris too. Yeah. So that was kind of the tipping point. And sure. was there anybody um, who guided you on your path, who helped you become the person that you are now, building what you're building now? Um, and so I had another incident happen about a year later, my sophomore year, um, where I, my apartment got raided and one of my roommates got arrested and. It was super traumatic as well. But after that, I said, okay, I'm not doing something right. I need to take a step back. And so I took a break from school, from university, um, and I got into personal development. I started reading books, taking courses, um, and also got a job at, a, at an airline. Um, and so I was able to start traveling. And that year I went to 15 countries. And that really just, you know, kind of completely shifted my trajectory because I was able to, to learn about the global language of humanity, you know, which really is love, right? I think love is something that you just feel. Um, it's the energy and it's the strongest energy in the world, right? Um, and so once I kind of had that idea of, okay, love is the strongest energy, you know, we're in a global community. So many people have so many unique stories. Um, and for me, I felt like in order to really uh, accelerated my entrepreneurial career, I needed to have some successful entrepreneurs, you know, in my circle, right? Yeah. And so after that year of traveling, I ended up going back to school. I changed my major to entrepreneurship. And literally the first day of classes, we had a guest speaker, a guy named Mike Russell, who owned a technology company, which is the one I will later work for. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, just came and spoke and told his story and I was really inspired. And so I asked him to be my mentor and he agreed. And then from there, we started meeting every week. I would go to his office with like 10 questions wow. that I would just Google, like 10 questions to ask a mentor, right? <laughs> and then I'd just ask him and I was learning so much and he was, you know, telling me where I should go and, how, and really influencing me to use my passion to start a business. Mm. And what was your passion at the time? Yeah, at the, at the time, my passion was writing. Yeah, writing was really my escape from just the things I was going through in, in, in um, real time. Right. And I wasn't going to therapy then. So at that time, writing was my therapy. It was my way to vent, my way to tell stories and my way to also ask questions, mm. you know. So what were the steps from, OK, you have a mentor now, you're majoring on entrepreneurship, um, you're starting to write a lot um, to building Blemish? Yeah, for sure. And so with, with writing, like I talked about stories, but the business that I ended up starting was a publishing company. Um, called Visionary Writing, where we would write and publish books for people, mainly entrepreneurs. Um, but once I heard my mentor story, I wanted to hear more. I wanted to meet more entrepreneurs. And so around that time, I also started a podcast where I would interview entrepreneurs, get their story, and then hopefully, you know, I would try to write a book for them. And so it was almost like a funnel strategy that I was using, but it was empowered by stories, right? And then, um, Ultimately, how that got to, to blemish is hearing the stories and realizing that in every one of these stories, there was a low point, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like there, it wasn't just all, you know, uphill. It was like this, it was like a roller coaster, right? Um, and the idea for blemish came around the time of COVID where globally it felt like a low point, 
right? And so for me, um, I was thinking about like what problem I could solve, you know, what is my, what is my purpose? And it's really just really for me going to therapy and, and discovering the, the resources that were there. Um, I felt like they weren't fully accessible to everyone, you know? And so I thought it would be a good problem to solve and a, a noble problem to solve to figure out how to uh, provide resources for mental well-being on a global scale. It was really around the time of COVID when it started affecting me personally because of course COVID was scary for everyone but around that time it was also a lot of um, a lot of talk about racial injustice you know in, in the U.S. Um, it was the killing of George Floyd which really sparked it off and around that time I felt just really um, you know confused because I didn't know how to how to talk about the emotions that I was that I was feeling, um, and so I sought therapy, mm. and I found a therapist and I asked for help, and they gave me resources on managing my emotions and understanding my emotions, and I just saw the power in that, and I was like, wow, it's not just something that I'm experiencing. I think everyone, you know, around the world has um, a desire to really understand why they feel the way they do. With Blemish, we're building a mental wellness platform for global accessibility so that a, a kid in Rwanda um, could hop online and you know, get mental wellness, but also you know, someone living in Beverly Hills could also hop online and, and get the same wellness. And so we've been connecting with wellness practitioners and technologists uh, from really all around the world to gain an understanding of what solutions look like that will provide mental wellness on a global scale. I mean, I'm excited, you know, I'm super excited, especially when you think about um, the barriers to mental health care right now. Costs, you know, accessibility, stigma. Um, I think there's an opportunity to decentralize mental health care, mm -hmm. right? Give, the, give ownership and power back to the people. Um, and also just allow individuals to have full ownership of their you know, mental health data. I think that's, that's super powerful, but also an opportunity to gamify, you know, gamify it too, gamify learning, um, gamify therapy, if you will. Like, I think there are so many different possibilities when it comes to, game, to, to Web3. Um, and I mean, I, I believe we're really gonna like shift the culture when it comes to, to mental health care and therapy, just by making it you know, look and seem cool um, and letting people know that, you know, it's normal to, to have mental roadblocks. Um, it's, normal, it's normal to struggle. It's normal to not have it all figured out. How did you get from the idea of Blemish to actually starting to build it? The first thing that came out, comes to my mind is just the people and relationships. Um, and so when I was working at the technology company, you know, it was my first corporate job and so I was you know making money and I decided to invest in a business coach around that time um, and I started getting some advice from different coaches and they were like you know you need to find someone who you know, looks like you and is kind of doing some of the things that you want to do and someone who could just give you advice to get to where they are if they're in a position where you want to be and so I, I, I was following this guy for a long time online it was this guy named Tony Gaskins and I was really inspired by his story um, he's, a, he's an author, a tech entrepreneur, a millionaire guy. Um, and so I reached out to him and asked him to be my coach. And I went into it intentionally wanting him to be my mentor. But on our first call together, he was like, you know, I don't really do mentorships, but I'll be your coach. <laughs> and then maybe four calls later, he was like, wow, I think we should do business together. <laughs> you know? And so the idea for Blemish, you know, um, originated around that relationship. And we both just have a heart for people and helping people in their storytelling. But over time, it kind of became more of just my baby, if you will. Um, and so I kind of had the autonomy to, to build it as I please. And I knew that me alone, I can only do so much, but with a group of powerful people, we can do powerful things. Uh, so now we're, we're a team of six and um, we're in, in beta testing for, for our first product, which is really cool. Um, and just continuing to, to build relationships and, and research with research and talk with professionals to see like what is the best thing to build. Mm. What would you say is the one thing um, as a fairly young entrepreneur that mm, 
makes you be able to sustain the journey of entrepreneurship, which is quite a journey in itself. Sure. I think <laughs> just what you said, just being young and being aware that I'm so young, right? Like I, w I went to Egypt last year and I met with, um, with the CEO of the leading mental health care company in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a fact that inspires me. He said the average age of a founder of a successful health tech company is 44. And I'm 26. <laughs> yeah. So let me know. Okay, I got 20. I got almost 20 years to get this right. So there's no rush. Nice. Low you know? pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. I, in 20 years, I'll figure something out for sure. If I you know, if I live that long, God willing, right? How so, did you set up that meeting, by the way? LinkedIn. Okay, cool. LinkedIn. Yeah, I mean LinkedIn is, is major. LinkedIn is part of the reason why why I'm here. You know, a, around the time where I was graduating college, I started reaching out to people on LinkedIn who lived in Paris. And I would just say, hey, I'm a college student. I want to move to Paris. Can you help me? Tell me more about that hustle. Hustle in terms of what did you do different? You know, what kind of ways did you find to, to, to get around challenges and so on? Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to think about like what challenges I've been through in the past because I try to always think present and future. Mm. And a present challenge that I'm dealing with right now is just how to navigate the fundraising journey. You know, being, being a black founder and knowing that black founders receive less than 1% mm. of total venture capital investing, yeah. it's like, okay, you already like, you, you have a battle to fight in the hill to climb. And so actively I'm trying to figure out how I can, you know, leverage the opportunity that I have, you know, being a black founder from America, living in Paris. And so now it's like, okay, how can, how can I really tell this story? The leverage I have is, is technology and my brand and my, my personality and just social media. You know, we have, everybody has an opportunity to tell their story and their unique perspective. Um, and so I believe like my ability to, to tell stories will really help in this challenge of fundraising. And so, I guess we'll see in a couple of months if, if that's true. <laughs> but uh, the cool thing about it is if, it, if it's not true, we'll figure something else out to try something else and, and just keep trying until we see success. And I think that's what, you know, the, the true hustle yeah. is, right? That uh, persistence and, mm. you know, not taking no for an answer, mm -hmm. uh, not saying failure as failure, but seeing failure as a lesson, mm. you know? Um, there's endless possibilities. I think the, the biggest obstacle that we have to get over as entrepreneurs and as humans is our own beliefs, um, our own doubt, but we can literally do anything, right? As, as I'm telling you this on a rooftop in Paris, it's like, 